agenda includes an intro to climate change. How does it affect us? <clears throat> what can we do about it? And then why should we do something about it? <clears throat> I'll be speaking on how do you know what's true? Matt Glazuski from uh, Portland Community College will speak on state of the science. Matt has a bachelor's in meteorology, master's in climatology, and teaches courses on climate change, meteorology, and oceanography at Portland Community College. Then Alice Brawley Chessworth from City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services will talk about how does it affect us. What can we do about it? Um, Kavita Hine, Climate Science Coordinator for Portland Water Bureau, will talk about what causes a utility to act on climate change. Lynn Stevens from Brown and Caldwell will talk about what Pacific Northwest cities and utilities are doing to prepare for climate change. <clears throat> Alan Johnston from City of Gresham will talk about Gresham Wastewater Treatment Plant's journey to become the first net zero energy treatment plant, second net zero energy treatment plant in the US. And Nick McCuller from Portland BES will talk about an ongoing project that they have, City of Portland has, to integrate resiliency into infrastructure. Then Matt Blazuski will take over for a wrap up on why should we do something about it. First, some observations. <clears throat> This is just data. The x-axis shows year 1800 through 2100, world population with projections by the UN. The black line is actual population estimated. The blue line, which really starts around 1950 through the present is actual populations. And you may notice that there was a big increase in population growth in around 1950. This Cindy, course, this is Mike, the office. Excuse me for interrupting, but uh, it looks like you might need to go to slideshow. We're seeing it in presenter mode. There. Thank you. Thank you. So, sure. Um, let's see if I can manage to make this transition. All right, so I was just pointing out the world population curve looks a lot like the world energy consumption curve. You'll see um, the x-axis is from 1820 through 2010, and there's an inflection point around 1950 when our energy consumption really takes off. And now in 2010 and beyond, we're using mostly fossil fuels, coal in red, oil in green, natural gas in purple. And that has resulted in a lot of um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the x-axis on this chart is from zero through 21, 2000, zero through the present. And you'll see for most of historical time and in, in that period where the planet was at around 280 parts per million CO2. And around 1950 again, it started shooting up. Now we've passed 400 parts per million um, CO2 emissions or concentration in the atmosphere just a few years ago. So how can we tell what's true? This is one of my favorite subjects, and it's probably not by reading the Chicago Tribune. This is their headline page from 1948. It says, Dewey defeats Truman, and that's not what happened. Actually, Dewey was ahead in the polls. Truman actually won, but the newspaper jumped the gun and printed it wrong. It's not the last time the newspaper's gotten something wrong. So when it comes to climate change and what's really happening, is there consensus? We can we can look at peer-reviewed science. If you're looking at news, radio, any of the media um, sources, 
talking to your friends, listening to politicians, those are not reliable sources for science information. The consensus is um, the overwhelming scientific evidence <clears throat> clearly shows that the planet's climate is changing and that humans have and are contributing significantly to, to climate change. I was really interested to hear this NPR segment just a couple of days ago. It said Spokane could become the next in a growing list of Northwest cities, including Portland, Seattle, Bend, uh, to commit to the Paris Accord, even though Trump has opted out of it this spring. So this is through the U US Climate Alliance. That's a group of states, cities, and businesses who are continuing commitment to the Paris Accord. I love this definition of science, objective and disinterested inquiry. And I've always loved Einstein quotes. So here's one. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. It's a good one. A couple of years ago, John Phillips and I um, spearheaded this effort to write the PNCWA climate change position paper. John at the time was sustainability committee chair. Now he's president of PNCWA and I was chair of the sustainability committee back then and still am. So we drafted it with this group of people. Dr. John Abatsaglu from University of Idaho is a prominent Northwest climate researcher. He reviewed it, so it has been peer reviewed and we used all peer reviewed science sources to write it. We had three reference documents. One is called What We Know, which is the climate change position paper by the AAAS. This is the world's largest general science organization. And the link is right there. This is a great paper. I highly recommend it. Climate Change in the Northwest Brief Summary by the North Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Group is the, another source we use. The link is right there. And then the last source is by our parent organization, the Water Environment Federation, called Protecting Water Resources and Infrastructure from the Impacts of Climate Change. So the position paper, I have just a couple of quotes in here. Climate change is dramatically altering the world's water environment in the following ways that you can read here. And this is of special interest to us in the clean water profession. The overwhelming evidence of human caused climate change identifies significant costs from current impacts and extraordinary future costs and risks to society and natural systems. I've included a link to the position paper so you can read it. It's a five pager, so not bad. So now I'll turn it over to Matt Glazewski. Thanks, Cindy. Oops, bear with me just for a second while I share my screen. Okay, so uh, as Cindy said, I'm Mike Lazuski. Uh, I teach uh, courses on climate change at uh, Portland Community College, and I'm also um, actively working toward uh, climate change, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies for uh, water utilities here in the Pacific Northwest. So first, uh, just a little bit of background uh, about, um, you know, what we know about climate change and, and, and um, what sort of efforts are underway in the world. I mean, we've certainly all heard um, a lot of different um, talk of the IPCC, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it's actually an international body uh, for assessing the science related to climate change. And it was set up actually in the late 80s by the World Meteorological Organization um, and the UN Environment Program, uh, and essentially just to provide policymakers with regular assessments of scientific basis of climate change, uh, its impacts, future risks, and options for adaptation and mitigation. And there are 195 members um, of the IPCC. And largely the efforts that come out of there um, it involve uh, uh, modeling efforts uh, and a whole bunch of different uh, policy recommendations. Uh, and then here back, back in the States, we have the uh, US Global Change Research Program's National Climate Assessments. Um, and those uh, are actually something that were um, established by presidential initiative, also in the late 80s, uh, 1989, and mandated by Congress uh, in the Global Change Research Act of 1990. Uh, to develop and coordinate a comprehensive and integrated um, U.S. research program, which assists the nation um, and the world to understand, uh, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. Um, and then we, 
we have the Pacific Northwest Climate Change Vulner Vulnerability Assessment, which is essentially uh, a subset of the National Climate Assessment, just looking here uh, more specifically at what's going on here in the Northwest. But um, that said, you know, how do we know um, about how climate change works? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of um, become a pretty popular uh, point of discussion. And we really have to go back and take a look at what our uh, understanding of the fundamentals of the science are in order to be able to explain this. Um, and what it comes down to is that it's actually some pretty basic stuff, um, some settled science that we've actually known for uh, 100 years or so. Um, that really just uh, on the whole uh, references the Earth's energy budget. Um, this graph shows essentially, if you were to imagine, uh, we had 100 units of solar energy coming in from the sun, you know, the source of all of our energy on planet Earth that uh, allow us to, to live here and, and, and uh, thrive. Um, there's a, a bunch of different ways that this solar energy interacts with the Earth's atmosphere. Um, some of it is absorbed in the stratosphere, some of it, which is um, the next layer of atmosphere above where we live. We live down here in the troposphere, where all our weather is and most of the air molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, most, most um, uh, excuse me, about 17 units of that 100 are absorbed in the troposphere. And then down here at the surface is where uh, about 50, about half of the solar energy is absorbed. Uh, these little dashed lines kind of show how some of it is actually reflected back to space. And then we take a look over here, and this is um, long wave radiation. So this is essentially infrared. This is stuff that we're always emitting. Uh, one of the examples I always like to say is that if you've ever ridden um, a bus or something like that, if you're on it by yourself, um, it can be you know, quite pleasant. You know, <laughs> maybe you don't have a lot of passengers, but also maybe the, the air inside the air conditioner is going or something like that. But then you get to a transit center, and 50 people get on, and then suddenly it gets pretty warm in there because people are emitting energy in the infrared at all times. And the Earth does that as well. Uh, on sunny days, when uh, the sun goes down, and um, after a nice warm day here in the summer in the Northwest, um, you've got some pretty low amounts of moisture in the air at nighttime, it cools off pretty fast because we're no longer taking in radiation from the sun. It's just being emanated back out to space. Um, albedo, this is essentially one of those big changes. This is, a, this is how, um, how much reflectivity something has. Uh, it's basically a scale from white to black. Um, white being something that reflects uh, all energy, solar energy, and black is something that absorbs it all. So this is this situation where we have places where very snow-covered, ice-covered landscapes, uh, a lot of the energy is reflected like a mirror right back out to space. Whereas when we have darker um, things, they absorb more energy, okay? Um, and then Cindy mentioned uh, briefly about greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases are a way that we essentially mess with this whole situation here, because if you start putting more gases um, into the troposphere that uh, are going to absorb that energy, then you start to mess up the, the budget, uh, the Earth's energy budget. So we can take a look at um, different contributions of different greenhouse gases to radiative forcing. And by and large, uh, carbon dioxide is, is the big uh, culprit when it comes to uh, absorbing uh, solar radiation. Uh, we also have methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, um, and chlorofluorocarbons and other gases as well. But by and large, the lion's share of the energy that gets absorbed um, in excess of our uh, general energy budget is by anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. And that's, that, that's really where the problem is. But just really briefly, uh, this is essentially showing you that where uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum we have different uh, wavelengths of, of light energy, right? Because the sun is throwing everything it has at us at all times. And then it passes through a, a series of different filters by the time it gets down to, here, to the surface. And in different bands of energy, certain molecules get really excited by those different bands of energy. They're each different gas essentially acts um, as a filter and it absorbs energy from the sun. And in the infrared, water vapor absorbs an awful lot. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but water vapor is something that was already a background gas that was in the atmosphere as part of the water cycle. Uh, so it's not necessarily one that we look at and say, hey, water vapor is the big problem here, because we're actually starting to offset, I should say carbon dioxide, not carbo dioxide, that's funny. Uh, but you can see the carbon dioxide uh, very, gets very excited, in very specific wavelengths of, of energy. And this scale here, the grayness here, this is the percentage of absorption. Uh, and you can see it really absorbs a lot of energy in, in one band uh, or multiple bands of energy that come from the sun. 
Uh, we also have just ozone and oxygen, just O2 and O3. Um, of course, we know about the ozone layer, uh, really absorbing a lot of ultraviolet so we don't get cooked when we go outside. Uh, and then methane, which we also know is a greenhouse gas, uh, nitrous oxide. And then Raleigh scattering, this is essentially uh, why the sky is blue sort of thing, okay? So that's just a background that we understand that greenhouse gases are really the issue. The greenhouse effect is a good thing because it's what makes our planet someplace that we can live in. But if we start taking uh, a whole bunch of carbon from these long-term reserves, things that are there for millions of years, just kind of outside the system and pump them into the short-term system, that's where we start to have issues because we're sort of offsetting a piece of the carbon cycle. And by doing so, uh, we're pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We already know based on the laboratory environments, one of the easiest tests to do in the world in a properly equipped laboratory is to put an artificial uh, atmosphere and start adding carbon dioxide and hitting it with, with photons, with light. And you can see that the temperature goes up because it absorbs that energy. Uh, this, this has been settled science for a very long time. Um, and it's, it's, one of the best uh, arguments that we can provide uh, for climate change, okay? So now we're just gonna briefly talk about what this really means um, here in the Northwest. One of the great things is that a lot of um, different, uh, all of our different states have state climatologists and they're usually attached to an academic institution and partially funded from, from different sources from the academics, but also from, um, from the state itself. And each one essentially studies the environment of how climate change can affect the Northwest. And that's really a terrific um, tool that we all have because some of our uh, state climate offices here in the Northwest have done some pretty uh, terrific work that's really been very useful and helpful in understanding our impacts here. This is just a summary slide. I don't like to put a lot of text on slides, but for this one, I think it really does hit it home. Um, and many of you are probably reading this, um, so I'm not really going to go through it too much, but I do want to just emphasize that we are looking, generally speaking, at a warmer planet. Uh, we've seen uh, the past several years have been warmer and warmer and warmer. If you take all of the temperatures observed around the globe and average them together, we continue to see an uptick in temperature. And that makes sense based on our understanding of how greenhouse gases uh, impact uh, the energy budget of the planet. So here in the Northwest, we're looking at continued warmth and we're starting to be able to see a couple different uh, occasions where it does appear that things have been exacerbated by climate change. Uh, weather is a short term thing, weather is day to day, whether it's sunny today, it's raining tomorrow, whatever. Climate is something that happens over a long, longer period of time. And we can start to see in some of these weather events, they become slightly more extreme. Uh, the most recent one would be the winter uh, of 2015, uh, where we saw very, very low snowpack uh, in the Cascades and other regions of the Northwest. And that can be a bit of a problem if we start to see warmer winters, where when, it's, when we're getting precipitation, it's not falling as snow, it's falling as rain. Because as you all know, we have a number of rivers and streams here in the Northwest that depend upon uh, melting snowpack during the summer months. So that's gonna be an issue. And some of the other speakers are gonna talk about that in a bit. Uh, we also have issues with coastal flooding and erosion. Um, those of you who uh, are in some of the coastal counties in Washington and Oregon, uh, or any tidally forced rivers are probably aware of, of what this type of uh, problem is. And um, that goes hand in hand with sea level rise. So if the water level is higher, the natural times when you would have coastal flooding will be exacerbated. Uh, ocean acidification, which is definitely a problem more for aquaculture. Um, and then shifting climates uh, can really have an impact on our fire seasons here in the Northwest, which definitely can affect our water quality uh, for drinking water, uh, but also essentially turbidity. And um, we will continue to have issues um, with insects and diseases uh, that will just essentially change the, the landscape as we know it. Um, and in some cases, uh, we will have some some gains in, in the world of agriculture, but in the long term, there's definitely going to be some, some issues as things become more hot um, and, and more dry. So in some cases, some of what we're experiencing right now is a little bit of a practice, practice run for the future. So I'm just gonna show a couple slides on uh, just a couple um, analyses. Uh, this is uh, an, a change in mean temperature. Uh, so we're comparing 1985 and to 2014, that time period, 
to the middle part of the century here from a regional super ensemble. A super ensemble is just a, a fancy computer model term where basically you have a, a model that uh, runs, but you just change a couple of the initial conditions uh, and then you run it over and over and over again. And a super ensemble is you have two different models in this case that have been run uh, I think over 136,000 times and then sort of averaged together. And then you can see these are um, up here, with uh, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. And the trend you can see here is definitely, um, this is all temperature uh, in degree C here, generally warming. Uh, we'll also take a look, this is from the third Oregon Climate Assessment Report, uh, which was just published in January of this year. It's an excellent document and it's free and I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, and even if you don't live in Oregon, it's definitely something that is um, uh, relevant to, to the rest of us here in the Northwest. Um, we've got two different graphs here uh, based upon uh, what we're looking at. Models, of course, right? Models give us a projection. They don't predict the future. Um, we can take a look at this RCP 4.5. This is essentially a low emission scenario. And this 8.5, which is a high emission scenario. So by the end of the century, we can see that we, we have a spread of generally warming temperatures under both scenarios. Um, and if we were doing a really great job at cutting a lot of our emissions, then we could see a, a lesser warning, which is essentially what the goal of the Paris Climate Accord was. So we can see a pretty big temperature spread potentially by the 2050s based on our current uh, model capability. And for precipitation, you can see the same thing. This is the low and high emission scenarios. And you can see a general increase, a slight increase uh, but potentially within the error margin, we can see that it may actually get a little bit drier as well. So we're looking more at a temperature impact. Um, and, and that said, not necessarily the amount of precipitation, but we'll be looking at uh, the type of precipitation as it falls. And that's something where we'll have to really take a look at, like I said, summer flow and our snowmelt watersheds. Uh, and we can, we've already seen uh, some, some marked declines um, over a period of time uh, in the lat later 20th century up to present. And we started to see a lot of those changes, not to mention the fact that we're getting more people uh, and people, of course, want to be dipping into the, to the rivers to, uh, uh, for agricultural and drinking water purposes. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention before I hand it off to Alice here has to do with sea level rise. And this is, of course, more for our, our friends that um, are hanging out in our coastal counties. Uh, whereas we see uh, melting ice in the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets, uh, that water goes into the ocean. Um, when it's frozen, it's removed from the ocean, of course, right? It's held up on a big brick. Uh, Greenland has 6% of the world's fresh water uh, sequestered in the ice cap, and it is melting. And of course, you probably have seen the news in Antarctica, the largest sea ice shelf. Uh, Antarctica has 93% of the world's fresh water just completely sequestered in it. So as that breaks off and melts and goes into the ocean, the water level goes up, okay? So we can see here, this is a prediction for sea level rise in Newport in Oregon. And you can see quite the spread there uh, toward the end of the century. But one thing you can see is that there's generally speaking uh, an issue with potential sea level rise. And we're already starting to see that. And, and where especially a lot of members here within PNWA come in is that we have a lot of um, wastewater plants that are less than four feet above mean high tide level, um, excuse me, that should say Oregon and Washington. Um, in Oregon and Washington here, because if you look at the Washington graph there, I mean, pick out your county, uh, and you can certainly see, I mean, Pierce County really and Grace Harbor County really jump out at you as some of the, the higher numbers there. But then you could go down to Oregon, you can see, you know, Tillamook and Clatsop. And even here in the Portland metro area where I am, you can see Multnomah County and Clackamas County uh, because the Willamette River is tidally influenced up to the falls. So this is going to be something that we really have to um, keep an eye on. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, with some of our other panelists here about what we can do about it. So with that, uh, I'm gonna to toss it over to Alice. Great, thank you so much. And I'm going to try to wrestle control of the screen from you here, Matt. So hopefully okay, that- stop share. Can everybody hear me or I, yeah. Hmm. Okay, yes, I see that I am. Yes. All right, great. Um, so let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, so Matt did a great job of um, presenting what's changing. Um, I won't go over that again, but I will mention a couple of things that he didn't mention is that um, we are seeing a potential change in the seasonality of some of the precipitation. So not only that it's changing form um, from snow to rain in some cases, but also that it's coming at just slightly different timing 
um, and also that has the potential to trigger landslides when we do see heavier storms coming in. So those are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind um, along with what Matt said, because um, what I'm going to do here is really take it to um, what do we need to think about for our facilities that we own or control or are responsible for in some way as water and wastewater professionals. And my intention here is not to, well, um, but I'll mention that, you know, I, there's, I'm going to look at technological systems, biological systems, and social systems. Um, but my disclaimer is that my intention is not to have a comprehensive list of everything you need to think about, but rather to get people to think big, um, not just the obvious things that you would sort of come to the top of your head when you read the headlines, but more of um, all of the things that you need to think about in order to really keep your systems running properly. Um, there's a lot on here. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to highlight maybe one or two things on each slide. Hopefully, um, there's not too many words on the slide, so you can read them as I talk. Uh, starting with water supply, this is one that is talked about quite a bit um, in the literature and in the popular media, and so it's no surprise that there can be some potential water supply concerns. Um, the concerns with storage and snow, there are some of our systems here in the Pacific Northwest that are not snow driven. And so if you have a rain driven system already, you don't have to worry about that. But you do want to think about whether or not the seasonality of your water supply is going to be changing. Um, for some of your equipment, um, particularly your pipes, um, there are quite a few things that can impact them. One of them is we don't really know what's going to happen with groundwater. Obviously, if you're along a coast, you probably are going to have some rising groundwater as the sea level rise goes as well. But further inland, um, we don't know if a slight uh, increase in overall precipitation is going to raise groundwater levels or if it's going to vary more seasonably. Um, but it is something we need to start thinking about for because when we go to do repairs on pipes, um, we might find that they're all of a sudden wet when they didn't used to be. Uh, for stormwater, of course, this is also a big concern for those of us in stormwater agencies. Um, one of our biggest challenges right now that I'm seeing is that we need to think about what we do with our design storms. We design our facilities um, using, for the most part, uh, the past uh, to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now that we know that the past isn't a good predictor, what do we use? That's uh, Unfortunately, we know that the past is not right, but we don't know what is right. Um, and so we have to make those choices. Are we going to adjust our de design storms every few years as more information comes in? Are we going to try to set one now of what we think is going to happen 100 years from now? As you saw from Matt's slides, there's great variability in that. But we are building facilities that are supposed to last for 100 years. And so what are we going to do about that? Um, our wastewater systems. Uh, one thing that Matt mentioned was the, the flooding of the, the plants themselves. But even if your plant doesn't flood, um, your discharge elevation in your river might change. And this could be from localized storms or it could be from sea level rise if you are tidally influenced or on the coast. Um, but you might end up having to pump more or move your discharge point and that can be a very costly thing. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that as the climate warms, your treatment processes might actually go quicker. Um, it's something that could be good and that you can push more through your plant, but you also have to think you might have to provide more air to your um, secondary system in order for it to function properly. And do you have the right sized equipment to be able to do that? Moving on to biological, um, since I have to go quick here. Um, these are things that if you're a stormwater agency, you really have to think about. And even if you're not, um, this is what really keeps water quality um, in check is our, our green infrastructure, both natural and built that we have in our communities. And um, I think we're more keenly aware of that in the Pacific Northwest and in other places. But, you know, we know hotter air equals hotter water, which equals dead salmon. Um, and that's a big deal in this part of the country. But there are also other animals that are affected. Um, beavers, turtles, all of these animals are used to a specific temperature regime and are under more stress and more susceptible to disease, disease when um, the temperatures rise. And for the food cycle, if you have predators and prey starting to um, hatch and mature at different times than they used to, they might not coincide in the way they used to. And so predators could have a real problem finding their traditional food sources. Um, and so we're going to have to think about whether or not that impacts us and what that means for our natural systems. 
invasive species, uh, as the climate changes, um, the species that are going to thrive here are going to change. Um, one thing that's, that's interesting to think about is we need to take advantage of this, so to speak, also in that our green infrastructure that we own and control, we need to start looking at what of these plants that are moving into our area are actually beneficial for us to use. If we can't use the old native plants and make sure that they survive through the long dry summers that we're predicted to have or through maybe some additional flooding, um, are some of those other plants that are just south of us now going to do that work for us and um, provide us with the same services. Um, another thing is just really looking at what happens to the natural systems themselves. Um, for flooding, if you have a healthy floodplain, it can probably um, absorb additional water when there's, when there's flooding, but most of us don't. Most of us live in areas where the floodplain has been impacted. And so really we're, we're looking at more erosion and scour um, of vegetation and of our built environment also. And we need to really think about that as well as the potential for more landslides, um, taking out some of our green infrastructure and um, things that we now get for free from the natural environment might not be there in the future. So one thing that um, I think most of us are engineers, um, we're infrastructure people, uh, we think about um, we think about the built environment, sometimes we think about the natural environment, but we also have to think about the social environment. One thing that we've seen here in Portland quite a bit lately is that um, there's an increase in the homeless population. And of course we can't contribute, we can't attribute that to climate change, but we are hearing that climate change is going to increase inequality. Um, so the types of problems we have now with poverty and inequality are probably going to only get worse. And so with that, there might be more vulnerable people who are in areas that flood more often than they used to. And what does that mean for us? Um, we are obviously not responsible as wastewater and storm and uh, water utilities for homeless populations. But if they're in our facilities, which has happened here in Portland, um, what does that mean for us in terms of maintenance and being able to provide our services? And of course, if the, um, the population of poverty increases, how are they gonna pay their bills? Uh, there's some conjecture that there will be climate migrants. Um, it's hard to know, but as there are uh, articles in the national media, which this um, this graphic here came from um, originally a national source that was published all over the country, shows that we're going to do a lot better than some other places. Um, you know, there is the possibility that people from places like Arizona and Texas will be moving northward. Um, we need to think about that. But one thing we don't think about very often is can we plan for population loss? There are some localized areas, even if the Pacific Northwest is going to do relatively well, there are some areas that are going to experience loss of population, either because of flooding or, you know, just drying and it not being as good a place to live. And can we plan for that? Can we learn from places like Detroit that have lost population? Um, you know, we've seen there that they have lost revenue, they have stagnant water in their mains that they um, have to flush more often. There is our unmaintained properties that we can't rely on their drainage systems um, being maintained appropriately. And so should we really be thinking about that now? Um, disease and illnesses, again, not our job, right? Except that our facilities might harbor vector borne or vectors, um, you know, like mosquitoes. And if there are additional vector borne diseases coming in, um, we might be asked to do more to control that. Um, as well as new diseases. If people might remember the Ebola scare um, a couple of years ago, wastewater treatment plant operators were worried about that. They were worried if they were vulnerable to infection um, from the potential of Ebola coming in to wastewater treatment plants. And so it is something that we need to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, speaking of our employees, if their house is flooded or they're ill, they're not going to be at work. Um, we might need to install air conditioning in facilities that don't have it now so that our um, personnel can continue to do their jobs. And of course, we do have a lot of people who work outdoors and they would have um, more vulnerability to heat stress in the future. And so what are we going to do about that? So that was a very, very quick overview of some of the main things you have to think about. And now I'm going to do a very, very quick overview of how, um, how to choose and how to decide what is the most important thing for you. And the one thing I can say is there are sophisticated things you can do out there. There's you know, asset management tools on how to prioritize these things. But if you're a very small system and you don't have 
a lot of time and resources to put into that. I would say the most important thing is to start with what you know. Um, where are you vulnerable now? Where are your pipes just barely able to contain um, the rainfall that you have right now? You have very little margin of error. And ask your, your experts, ask the people in your community um, where they see problems or where they um, are already see, starting to see things change um, and use that local expertise. Don't um, worry about the fact that you don't have some national expert um, to come and tell you what to do. Sometimes the, the local people actually are more experts on your system than they are. Some ideas um, for starting, and I'm sure others are gonna talk more about kind of what to do, but um, my recommendation is to try to diversify your actions, um, take some hard and soft actions. So a hard action would be um, building a bigger pipe if, if necessary, or moving um, your outlet to your wastewater treatment plant. But a soft action would be to monitor um, what's going on somewhere and propose maybe some trigger points or decision points of when you would want to take action um, and find out what your data gaps are. Um, those are more of the soft actions that you can take. And so with that, um, my takeaway is from here to think broadly, um, start with what you know, and to realize that not everything's going to be done at once. Um, this is something that we are going to continue. The changes are going to continue for decades to come. And so our work will continue to, for decades to come also. And so that is the end of my presentation. And I will hand off now to Kavita. Hi, everyone. This is Kavita Hine. I'm the Climate Science Coordinator for the Portland Water Bureau, which is the drinking water utility for Portland, Oregon. And I, um, I'm going to share with you some thoughts I have that are related to the two present or several presentations we've just heard about now that we know sort of what the impacts might be for our different systems, what would cause us or motivate us to act or plan for climate change? And uh, what are some considerations that utilities really need to focus on? So I'm sure you'll hear a little bit of repetition. Um, that's probably a good thing because we want to emphasize some key points where we've learned lessons from our peers and others. So um, to start with, I just want to give you an overview of uh, Portland's water system since um, – has my slide changed? If someone can give me feedback on that, that would be good because – there we go. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> so let me give you some overview of Portland's water system. Now, I'm talking from a drinking water perspective. So I know many people in the room are focused on wastewater and stormwater, but I think there are lessons learned that can, again, as I said, apply to other types of systems. If you're not familiar with Portland's drinking water system, we're part of the city of Portland, and the city of Portland has two supply sources. The Bull Run Watershed is located to the east of Portland on the Mount Hood National Forest and it's our primary surface water supply. The city also has a second uh, supply in a well field along the Columbia River. It's a groundwater system. So uh, the well field serves the purpose of um, replacing our Bull Run watershed supply uh, during a couple of different types of events. When we experience extreme winter storms, we see turbidity in Bull Run, where we have to turn off Bull Run because the water becomes non-potable um, based on drinking water regulations. And so we uh, provide our groundwater system supply instead. Also, in some years, there is not enough supply in our Bull Run watershed during summer months when demand is really high. And in those cases, we would supplement our supply with our groundwater system as well. The Bull Run supply is unfiltered, I forgot to mention. And so that's why we need to turn it off if, if there are turbidity events. So um, I also want to mention that the Portland Water Bureau is part of the Water Utility Climate Alliance, which you probably haven't heard of, but I want to make you aware of it. It's a member, it's a coalition of 11 large drinking water agencies, although some of them, obviously, as you can see on the map, uh, you're probably familiar with some that do wastewater and stormwater as well. And WUCA agencies, as they're known, uh, collectively serve 50 million drinking water customers nationally. WUCA's mission as this group is to collaboratively advance water utility climate change change adaptation. And so we've learned a lot of lessons of this group of utilities over the years on how to prepare utilities, drinking water, but also wastewater and stormwater utilities for a different future with climate change. And I encourage folks to visit the WUCA website to access different resources on the type of thinking we're encouraging utilities to do. So I'll refer to some of these resources in my presentation, but I wanted to mention that this, um, this uh, web page is available. Um, I encourage you to access it. So for the Portland Water Bureau, you know, going back to this question of what causes us or motivates us to act, well, for us, our interest in planning for climate change impacts to the drinking water system has really evolved over two decades. Our climate change analysis uh, started with a report actually conducted in the early 2000s that fed into our infrastructure master plan. 
And the report came up with very specific descriptions of what climate change and increasing water demand would mean for our supply, notably that we would probably need more supply. However, significant aspects of our system changed soon after the report was completed. So we went basically from expecting to increase supply to dealing with falling demand. So the study, the, both the climate study and the infrastructure master plan ended up having a fairly short shelf life and became rather irrelevant. So one of the things we learned from this experience is that we want the ability to plan for more than one type of future because things change. And we want to do this in an iterative way and not be limited to conditions from many years ago. We also realized we want to be able to build the capacity internally to plan for climate change and other future changes. So as a result, what we've done is um, invested, and we have the resources to do this, of course, but we've invested in developing customized climate and hydrologic modeling tools for our system, and we've worked with climate scientists in the Northwest to do this. But um, I will say for even smaller to medium-sized utilities, what I've found to be the most useful in our climate change planning work is the people who are involved. So really building that staff capacity to involve hydrologists, uh, water resource planners, modelers, and engineers is really integral to getting lots of different um, people involved in thinking about the future and how your system might change. So this, um, this graphic is not supposed to be for me to go into detail about how we're doing the different types of modeling and what resources we're using, um, but it's simply to illustrate that there's a combination of different tools we're using. Some are more complicated than others, from global climate models to hydrologic models. Um, but ultimately, it's that um, staff capacity and ability to understand both our system, as Alice referred to, but also to use these tools internally that, that really is enabling us to plan for the future. Our goal is to use these different tools and resources to come up with um, future supply scenarios for our Bullwarn watershed, which also indicates how much we might have to use groundwater in the future. Um, and feed that into our supply system master plan, our long-term plan. We're not just looking at water supply, but also water quality because stream temperature and turbidity are important components of, of the resources that we manage. And of course, water demand, how that might change with climate change and population change is an important factor. So um, I just wanna say that there are different types of resources that a utility might use, um, but planning adaptively has been a real motivation for us. The other thing that I think is really effective um, as a, you know, a utility water resource manager is having an event to describe what the future could look like. A lot of um, utility personnel spend their days focused on daily operations and maintenance and don't necessarily have the time to step back and think about the bigger picture. And I think those of us in the planning realm can do this and help tell the story. So for example, in the Northwest, as we heard a little bit from Matt, 2015 was a really um, hallmark year. We had record low snowpacks, record breaking high temperatures, extremely low soil moisture, and, and other conditions that led to widespread hydrologic impacts across the region. For the Portland Water Bureau, we experienced the longest and earliest reservoir drawdown we've ever had, and as a result, had to use the most amount of groundwater in that year than we've ever had to before. Um, in addition to the water supply challenge, we also have to manage stream temperature for endangered salmon in our watershed, and that was particularly challenging in that year, given the fact, fact that there was very little cold water available from snow. So um, I point this out because I think it's important for utilities to recognize the signs of warming that are evident now, and um, years like 2015 can be used to describe what the future might look like and ask questions about how that would affect your system. So um, Alice referred to, you know, how do we design differently, whether it's your design storm or, you know, your dam or your conduit or your pipes, how do we design things differently and wh why should we care about that as utilities? Well, I think this is another thing that really incentivizes a lot of the utilities we work with to, to um, plan and act for climate change. And so the reason is that typically um, utilities have used, engineers and utilities have used the observed historical record, which often only goes back like 100 years, if that, which is actually not that long when we think about it. Um, we've used this record to design and build infrastructure in our utilities. But this may no longer be sufficient for the future. And so I kind of want to illustrate why. So if we have, for example, our historical temperature record, which is shown here in orange, you can see that the temperature increases from left to right in degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then on the y-axis, I've got the probability of occurrence of different temperatures. So basically, we're looking at a probability distribution here. Um, historically, we've got average temperatures that occur most of the time, and then occasionally we have cold or hot temperatures that are extremes, right? So planning infra infrastructure designs usually take account of this range. However, the challenge is that climate change is effectively shifting the probability distribution of weather and hydrologic events so that the record extremes like 2015 tend to become the, the average conditions of the future, uh, the new normal, if you wish. Um, and so that's problematic, but also new extremes begin to emerge that our systems have not been tested against or designed for. And that probability shift really can increase the risk of failure of utility assets and infrastructure. So if you kind of want to think about a reason of why you might want to plan for a more resilient infrastructure system, this is why maybe the designs we have are just not sufficient. And even with safety buffers, maybe the, some of those safety buffers are not effective um, for all future conditions. And so because of that engineering and design challenge, I just want to make you aware that the American Society for Civil Engineers has actually put out a report called Adapting Infrastructure and Civil Engineering Practice to a Changing Climate. And they encourage engineers to develop a new paradigm for engineering practice in a world in which climate is changing and suggest engineers should seek alternatives that do well across a range of possible future conditions like I just mentioned. So for example, can your system deal with a flood and a drought? Do you need to increase your factor of safety even further? I want to highlight a couple of examples, practical examples of how utilities are doing this nationally. Um, and uh, the examples I have actually come from a survey that the Portland Water Bureau did in 2015 of 18 national and international water utilities, both drinking water but also wastewater and stormwater, where we asked the question of these utilities, how are you assessing climate risks to your water utility built assets and infrastructure? You can access this, this report at the Water Utility Climate Alliance webpage, um, which is shown below. So um, a couple of examples I have include the fact that, you know, in Fort Worth, Texas, the Tarrant Regional Water District experienced some record-breaking hot temperatures in 2011, both air temperatures and lake temperatures. And they um, had these pump motors that basically have been fine for decades in the hot temperatures in Texas, which you can imagine are really hot compared to the Northwest, but were now failing in really extreme heat. So in response, the water district installed new cooling systems that don't require the lake water for cooling and which can operate at higher temperatures. Another great example comes from New York City, of course, where after Hurricane Sandy, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection opted to redesign certain wastewater pump stations that failed during the storm because electrical components buried underground were flooded. So new designs recommend moving these components above ground to be able to withstand future storms that may be as severe or more severe than Sandy. And then San Francisco Public Utilities Commission has a sewer system improvement program um, whose levels of service goals include a goal to modify the system to adapt to climate change. So this is a way that the utility is mainstreaming climate change preparation into its levels of service. You can see um, right here that one of the levels of service is that new infrastructure must accommodate expected sea level rise within the service life of the asset. And it even specifies the inches of sea level rise that the infrastructure should be designed to deal with by certain time periods. So again, more examples are available in the report and I just wanted to sh sort of show a practical face to what it means to um, build more resilient infrastructure. Finally, I just want to end with this thought that um, while reevaluating engineering design standards is important, like I've just talked about, there's unfortunately not just one set of new design standards that we can apply moving forward. Utilities will need to grapple with the large amount of uncertainty in the climate information. Now, let me clarify what I mean by uncertainty. I'm not talking about the physics of climate change that Matt talked about. I'm referring to the spread in global climate model projections due to assumptions about what future greenhouse gas emissions will be. We don't know exactly what they'll be. And also, um, we don't know exactly how the climate system will respond. So there's a large spread um, in what the future could look like. In the Northwest, um, as Matt showed you in a previous graph, we really could um, see a whole range of different things when it comes to precipitation. And that's obviously important as water utilities. We really care about what happens with water. Um, and so in the spring and fall months, um, for example, the Portland Water Bureau is really concerned about the timing of reservoir refill and um, 
fill and refill. And so we really care about this time period. However, we're having to deal with really a range of information in the, in the climate data. So this graphic illustrates that. Each of the dots here is a global climate model projection. And each of the colors is a different greenhouse gas emission scenario. And so what you see on the y-axis is the change in precipitation. Anything above zero is an increase. Anything below zero is a decrease. And then the months of the year and seasons are on the x-axis, including the annual change. And this is a change in precipitation for the middle of the century in the Northwest compared to a historical period. So you can notice straight away that there's no clear number that you can plan for as an engineer, right? There's a real spread in what um, precipitation could look like in the future. If we look at just the spring and fall months, which I said are important for us, for example, we see that precipitation could increase, it could decrease, or it could stay the same. So how do we deal with that? We can't just take the average um, because it's not any more likely than one of the outliers here. Um, it's really important, as uh, I think someone mentioned, to note that these uh, climate projections are not predictive. They're supposed to give us a plausible range of future conditions. And so one of the final reasons I wanted to mention that utilities want to act on climate change is that you can't plan for just one future. You're going to have to plan for multiple futures. And so you want to think about your system operating in a range of conditions like both floods and droughts, as I said before. If it doesn't, then maybe it's not robust enough and you need to examine your vulnerabilities. So that's a lot of information on planning for multiple futures. If you want more, uh, more information on this topic, you can go to the Water Utility Climate Alliance webpage and find a, this paper on embracing uncertainty, which talks about how utilities around the world are planning for different uh, future conditions. So just to wrap up, um, I just want to um, summarize that I think there's a lot of considerations that utilities have to act on and plan for climate change. And as I mentioned, the things might have to, those, those actions might have to do with building capacity to plan adaptively and wanting to do that, recognizing that warming is here and now and we better take some action, designing for future conditions and extremes to make our infrastructure more resilient, and then planning for multiple futures. So with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and hand it over to Lynn. Thanks, Savita. Okay, just bringing up the screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So uh, I'm Lynn Stevens. I work with uh, Brown and Caldwell, and I help different utilities with climate change planning. And I'd like to highlight a survey that we did last year uh, the Pacific Northwest professionals and kind of better understand how water and wastewater professionals are planning for and adapting to climate change and extreme events. And so what I'd like to do is highlight the findings uh, from that survey. Uh, first, with summarizing some demographics and experience, and then focusing on some of the resources that the survey respondents recommended. So just some quick background on the survey. Um, there's just over 20 questions, and it was sent to PNCWA membership and Brown and Caldwell's DC Water News followers in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Um, the survey received a pretty good response. We had 182 responses, uh, of which 130 respondents uh, were with public and private utilities or with city or county government. So basically over 70%. Uh, the remaining 30% was comprised of consultants. Uh, they made up 18% state and federal government, educational institutions, manufacturers, contractors, NGOs, and retirees. So just to focus on um, the utilities and the government agencies that re responded, um, the majority service that was provided was wastewater, um, but a large percentage also uh, provided drinking water and stormwater services as well. Uh, we had a good distribution in the terms of the size of the entities that responded um, with 10% covering uh, utilities serving over a million customers. Um, and then a pretty equal distribution um, between medium and small size utilities. And so one of the main questions we asked, I'm just gonna highlight uh, a few of the findings, um, was whether they had experience with climate change or extreme event planning. And basically 30% of survey respondents said they had experience with climate change planning. About another 30% um, had knowledge and consideration of climate change and extreme event planning, but really hadn't implemented it yet. And then another 30% didn't have experience, but was interested in learning more. 
Um, we also had 14% respond that they didn't have knowledge and they didn't have interest. And this uh, highlights the results for everyone who filled out the survey. We also uh, wanted to uh, better understand that same question um, for different groups that answered the survey. So we looked at planning experience for just the utilities and cities and counties um, based on the size of that entity. And uh, what you can see, unfortunately, the place where it says percentage is 18%. Uh, this is a conversion from a PC to a Mac. But you can see off the bat that the number of no's and no interest uh, has decreased compared to everyone who filled out the survey. So there's a stronger interest uh, with utilities who filled out the survey. And then also there's a strong trend of larger utilities having more climate change and extreme event planning experience. I think the reasoning there will become more apparent when I highlight some of the obstacles, but it was an interesting finding uh, from the survey. We also uh, investigated uh, how that question varied based on geographic area. And you can see from this figure that Western Washington and Oregon had the highest level of planning experience. And that tracks with where our larger utilities are located in the Pacific Northwest. Um, what I found interesting as well was that Eastern Washington and Oregon utilities who responded were pretty positive. They either had experience, had not applied their knowledge, or were interested in learning more. Um, Idaho also had some intriguing results, and it may be a matter of who responded to the survey, but there was uh, no planning experience um, from those that responded, and by far this had the highest response and no experience and no interest that I think really weighted the overall results with the survey as well. Um, we looked at drivers for planning efforts and, you know, Kavita and others have both highlighted those as well, but based on the survey, 83% um, uh, were motivated based on concern over infrastructure resiliency. Uh, respondents also uh, could check more than one option and it was driven by public demand and responding to impact utilities feel they are already seeing today. So we talked about the 2015 drought um, and folks seeing uh, the, the impact of climate change already. And when you compare the responses of those who had initiated the planning to those who had not, despite not having political backing, they were seeing infrastructure issues and then responding to community support. Um, and I just want to ask real quick, someone's uh, microphone's not muted. If you could mute it, we're just hearing a little bit of typing. So uh, we also looked at obstacles in the survey and funding received the highest response as a major challenge or potential reason for not embarking on climate change and extreme weather planning. And then another 30% uh, weren't sure how to interpret climate change data or make decisions given the available information. And that's just given uh, what Kavita talked about, you know, given the uncertainty with uh, carbon emissions and some of the predictions, what decisions uh, schools and you utilize. And hopefully, as I talk about some of the resources and strategies uh, briefly, it will help to point folks in the right direction who see this as an obstacle. Uh, some of the steps for overcoming obstacles uh, it focused on increased collaboration, both internally uh, within the organization or with other branches of government. Um, so, for example, Clean Water Services responded that they initiated a program to identify available information and brought together a group from different departments within their organization to determine what impacts might be on their operations. Um, and then City of Olympia encouraged state and federal government support. Uh, we've helped a lot investigate sea level rise for their blood and wet wastewater treatment plant. And the predictions for the region cause a good amount of the city to be underwater during high tides in future years. So a lot of collaboration there um, with state and local government. Um, respondents to the survey also recommended going to the experts. Um, so uh, Savita highlighted what Portland Water Bureau is doing. Uh, King County is investigating or investing, excuse me, in research. Uh, City of Bremerton is working with the EPA and the Climate Impact Group, which is a great resource in this region. Um, additionally, someone highlighted hiring uh, consultants who without a vested interest in the outcome. So what are the, the tools that 
uh, folks are recommending to fill out the survey. Well, for climate change planning, it's important to look at long range forecasts uh, for climate model predictions and using hydrologic modeling to really understand local surface water impacts. So it's moving uh, beyond short term planning to look at impacts in 2050 or 2100 so that the steps can be taken now um, so that things really aren't too overwhelming, it's, you know, given some of the forecasts uh, from the climate change model. It's also utilizing a decision support planning process or scenario planning, giving the future uncertainties. And then respondents also recommended asset management risk assessment, first responder training, and community emergency response simulation exercises, and then really incorporating resiliency planning in the capital improvement planning and operations process, as well as um, excuse me, operations hydraulic modeling. There are also some national resources recommended, um, and I would also second I've utilized these, um, including EPA's adaptation strategy guide for water utilities, and uh, also mentioned was the National Stormwater Calculator. Um, additionally, uh, the climate impact group, working with them and uh, different professors from University of Washington, University of Idaho, and Oregon State University. And then several softwares uh, were mentioned from survey respondents, including the stormwater management model with climate adjustment tool, SwimCat, Sensei, uh, which is an energy efficiency software, um, using water balance modeling tools um, to understand the impact to surface waters and water supplies, um, as well as uh, SimClim is a uh, software tool to facilitate assessments of risk um, as well. And then a good carbon calculator to understand the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, additionally, uh, NOAA has a resiliency toolkit that was recommended. And then I was second to Vita by recommending the Water Utility Climate Alliance, which has produced some excellent papers and resources that can walk a utility through how to go about incorporating climate change into the planning processes. And so lastly, I'd just like to highlight specifically the adaptive planning and scenario planning, uh, which Luco recommends and I've used in helping several utilities understand climate change impact, um, including a study I'm working on right now with Honolulu Board of Water Supply. Adaptive planning is important because it promotes flexible decision making in the face of uncertainties and given the uncertainty with future carbon emissions, scenario planning helps look at multiple future conditions that could be to describe big determined solutions and projects that are most robust given the wide range of multiple futures. And then ideally you can identify some no regret options and then some trigger points that can help you understand when you should implement that project given when you see a future condition. So uh, with that, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, um, Rick Kelly and Joni Salta, Brown and Caldwell, and give a special thanks to Michael Rainey and the Sustainability Committee that helped us uh, distribute the survey. And if you're interested in more of the survey results or a few case studies of how uh, these resources have been applied, you can refer to the presentation or feel free to contact me. And uh, now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Alan. Hi, thanks, Lynn. I'm gonna switch it over to my screen now. <clears throat> my name is Alan Johnston. I'm the uh, wastewater treatment plant program manager for the city of Gresham. I wanted to thank the PNCWA for asking me to talk today about our kind of our energy net zero path uh, that we've done and I'll also talk about uh, some of the other just sustainable things that we do at the Gresham wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> the, uh, sorry about that. The, uh, Kind of the history here at Gresham was in 2005, we uh, installed a brand new 
co-gen number one here, and it's been very successful. It's been in, in for 12 years. It's produced about 50% of the plant electrical needs over those 12 years. It's had a runtime history of 93%. Uh, we had a gas scrubbing back then and uh, remove H2S and siloxanes. That project saved us about $250,000 a year in avoided electrical costs. We determined with that first engine that our costs for maintenance were about two cents a kilowatt hour, which has been pretty reasonable. And that project had about a three and a half year payback. There were several major developments in 2008 and nine to our path to energy net zero. One of the biggies was that the Gresham City Council passed a sustainability policy. Uh, they wanted 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050 and a goal of 100% renewable energy use by 2030. Uh, we also completed a uh, energy independence study uh, via code digestion and cogen expansion that proved to be feasible through a state of Oregon uh, grant back then that really kind of kicked off what we did here. We also in 2000, uh, the very beginning of 2010, started up a new 420 kilowatt solar array. And we, we also in 2010 created a formal energy management team. Uh, we, we set a goal with that, one of the first meetings we had back then to be energy net zero by 2015. So we gave ourselves five years to look into all the options, make sure it was cost effective and uh, you know, get everyone on board to do the projects. We selected energy team members, uh, had a team leader, ops managers, engineering, maintenance manager came to those meetings. Uh, we, we still to this day have them every month. And, uh, you know, we talk only about energy, the past month's energy consumption, the past month's energy production, and what we can do to make sure that it continues to work well. We also developed an energy management plan. Uh, we keep that updated and look at it every month. Uh, we select and prioritize and evaluate projects during those meetings, and we try to stay on track. One of the other biggies with uh, you know, these 12 years of projects is looking into energy conservation projects. So in 2012, we did these biggies here that reduced our energy consumption at the plant by 17%. The picture on the right is the uh, linear motion mixer that we installed in both our digesters. It's an eight foot diameter uh, disc that goes up and down 20 inches. Uh, we also um, added, uh, removed the uh, gas mixing that was in our digesters. Uh, we installed high efficiency Neuros turbo blowers and replaced all of the uh, aeration diffusers throughout the whole plant with high efficiency diffusers. So another project that we did was looking into fog receiving and we knew we'd need to do something like that to increase our biogas production at the plant in order to become energy net zero. And this has been pretty successful here. We did kind of what I'd call a pilot project, uh, tank one in 2012, uh, turned out to be very successful. The, Biogas production rates per gallon of fog were even above our expectations and they continue to be today. So after that successful project, we added a 20,000 gallon uh, tank two that gave us 30,000 gallons total. We're now receiving 12 to 13,000 gallons per day, which is about the maximum our digesters can handle. Uh, we, we did a, uh, in 2016, did $350,000 in fog revenues. So that's been very successful too. We partner with five haulers in the area, contract with them. So only they can come and discharge fog into these tanks. The biggie really what this project is that our biogas production has almost doubled. And I'll show a trend on that on a later slide. So here's our, just kind of our history. 2010, 11, we weren't accepting fog. We started with that pilot project in 2012. 2014 added the second uh, tank. And then in 2016 was really our first calendar year of full production. So we had both co-generators installed here. We had, uh, we're receiving all the fog we can receive. And, and it was a very successful year, as you can see there. Our, our biogas went for about 180,000 
uh, cubic feet per day to over 300,000 here in this last year. We used to flare the biogas prior to the second cogen installation. Uh, this was the last project in 10 years of, of projects towards energy net zero. This was completed in January 2015. So we've had uh, two 400 kilowatt cogenerators in operation now for over two years. And here's, here's their installation, Cogen 1 installed in 2005, and then uh, two years ago, Cogen 2 installed right next to it. We knew we couldn't add buildings and do things like that with this project, or it wouldn't have been cost effective, so we used existing building space. We also had CAT uh, provide the exact same make and model CAT, which has really helped with maintenance costs and understanding how the engines work. So I grabbed this slide out of our SCADA system, uh, I think uh, a couple days ago, so it's pr pretty new, but this is kind of a typical energy production and consumption for us nowadays on a sunny day in the summer. As you can see, we were doing 1.1 megawatt of power. We were consuming 668 kilowatts. And then you, in the grab, this is a 24 hour graph that you see in the center there. And we were exporting, top right you can see we were exporting 436 kilowatts back to the grid through our net meter. So it's a, in the summer we do quite a bit of power production here. So what is energy net zero? I know everyone has a different uh, definition of it. This is kind of Gresham's. Uh, we, our goal is to produce more kilowatt hours in a year through our net meter than we consume. And we've been doing that since uh, February two years ago. And I cut out, this is right off our PGE bill. You, you can see it, this is a typical bill now. Our bills went from $50,000 a month prior to all these projects to now it's just around 4000 and those are just demand charges and billing charges and things like that. So that's the lowest we could possibly get our bill and still actually be connected to the utility. A little busy, but this is our power consumption since that first cogen went in and power production. So the green you can see is cogen one that's been in since 05. Uh, the yellow there is when we added solar. And then the blue line is when we added Cogen 2 and met our goal of being energy net zero. So we net exported quite a bit last year. Um, I think it's on the order of 12% or thereabouts. That power uh, actually gets given back to PGE, kind of donated back to PGE at the end of the net meter year, which is March 1st. And uh, so far we've donated you can see in the bottom there, 892,600 kilowatt hours back to uh, PGE twice. And, and so we are net, net exporters, uh, but, but it doesn't do us a whole lot of good because they don't buy it back. There's just a few sustainability energy features kind of, uh, you know, above the net zero stuff that we do. We also do lots of other neat stuff, I think, that isn't talked about a whole lot including, you know, just land applying biosolids as a fertilizer is a great thing that you can do. Uh, we recycle more than 12,000 gallons a day of fog uh, here at the plant. We shoot for LED street and area lighting when we're doing projects, same with interior lighting. We've gone to try to use motion and photo sensors so the lights automatically turn on and off. Uh, we install premium efficiency motors in all of our projects and try to design for that. Uh, also use VFDs as needed to keep uh, electrical consumption down. One thing we do here is we try to heat buildings with our hot water loop. This is reject heat from the engines. We, we currently only use on average 35% of our heat production, so we're looking at ways to use that better. Um, but we're doing three out of our you know, eight buildings with hot water heat. Uh, so we're slowly adding buildings to that hot water loop to get rid of the uh, electric strip heat heaters in our other buildings here. Uh, we also uh, keep an electric vehicle with charging station for all staff to use here. Essentially, it's free fuel for, for the car. Uh, we also, I'll talk a little bit about it next, but we're also a great program to help businesses. And this is you know, obviously a little busy, but Gresham uh, 
It's called the Gresham Resource Efficiency Assistance to Businesses Program that the treatment plant is a member of. Uh, the program provides free outreach to help reduce waste, water, and energy. So we use them a lot with uh, some of the more difficult issues regarding that. Like you'll see here, the you know, two containers we have, one's a recycle, they're clearly labeled, and one's, uh, one, you know, one's for bottles and cans, and one's for paper, and we have those all over the plant. Uh, we, have, we do regular semi-annual catch basin and storm line cleaning here, which keeps us in compliance with uh, some of our other environmental permits. We use third-party certified green cleaners. Uh, those are provided by the GREAT program and reviewed by them. We also have uh, one of our buildings is LEED certified here. It's our thickener building that we rehabbed. Uh, we try to pr uh, purchase consumables and do all sorts of stuff you can see there, but all of those things add up, including send setting our printers to de default two-sided printing. Everyone always asks me about costs. You know, it was great you did all those projects, but man, it must have been a fortune. Well, it certainly wasn't cheap, but here's kind of a, an outline of that. About 38% of the projects uh, were paid for through grants from the, Bet the old Betsy program and the newer CHP Energy Incentive Program, as well as the Energy Trust. Uh, these pro all of these projects combined have about a six and a half, seven year payback. So it was a very, very good project for us. And here's, here's the actual revenue and avoided utility costs. Um, we were shooting for about 800 grand, you know, seven years ago when we started looking at this. And we're just about there in 2016. Uh, we've had four and a half million dollars in savings since 2005 with these projects. And... Uh, I think uh, 2007, $100,000. So I have to brag a little bit when I do uh, presentations on our Energy Net Zero project. Uh, these are just some of the awards that we've gotten. The newest one at the very bottom that we just received uh, last month, the 2017 Great Business Award for what we're doing here at the wastewater treatment plant. So everyone here is pretty proud of that one. And I'll hand it off to, I think it's going to be Nick. Thank you. That's coming over to me. Let's see what we'll do with that. All right. Well, that should be coming through now. My name is Nick McCuller. I'm an engineer with the City of Portland Bureau of Environmental Services. I have been working on our Resiliency Master Plan, which is a project to prepare our sewer system for uh, two disasters, the Cascadia earthquake and also climate change. So I want to I think I'm going to focus here on, on resiliency as a, as a concept and then talk about how resi resiliency can be applied at different scales and then uh, hopefully talk about a little bit more specifically about how we're going to get from global climate models down to pipe sizing uh, at, by the end of our project. So we are also a little behind on time. So if I start speeding up, you'll know why. So the resili Resiliency Master Plan includes both earthquakes and climate change. Now these are disasters of very, two, two, very, very different kinds, um, and, and climate change also includes little disasters inside of it, things that, that are s storms, landslides, floods, uh, and ecological problems that are you know, effects of a larger, uh, sub-effects of a larger, a larger driver. I want to connect resiliency to what we already know about sustainability. We know that we, we want to avoid unsustainable growth. We want to try to maximize, um, maximize our systems to, to work over the long run. But we can't really call ourselves sustainable in the long run if our systems can't withstand a little bit of disruption and, and come back. So what are some things that we can do? after disruption to uh, 
to get back. Here's, here's sort of the, the anatomy of a, of a disruption, and, and and you can see by the, the the suddenness of that disruption, this is this is what we think about a, with an earthquake. It's also could be a could be a flood or, or another one day event like that. But we're uh, we're going along. Our level of service is fine and normal, uh, and then something bad happens. So then after that, we have to assess the situation, plan what we're going to do about it. Hopefully, we've done some of that planning ahead of time. We've got some repairs, easy repairs to make, and then some bigger stuff that's going to take take a while. And when we get back, when we when we finish all that, we're, we're going to find that maybe some of that disruption is going to be permanent. Maybe we've lost some customers or uh, some some population, uh, or maybe there's some some permanent damage to the ecology. So ways that we can minimize this disruption is is through mitigation. That's going to be preventing failures or making the impact of failures smaller. With with mitigation, we talk about climate mitigation, and that's usually referring to emissions reductions or things that are we're trying to do globally to, to keep down the overall change from, from the overall effects of climate change. We can also talk about it um, more specifically for individual events. We can also be able to repair things faster. So this is going to be a test, not so much our, our previous, you know, the mitigation is a, is a test of the strength or the resistance of, of our infrastructure at the time of the of the, the disaster. This is a test of our institution's ability to do projects, um, of our, our ability to plan ahead of time and our ability to complete things on, on schedule and on budget. And then we also have the option, we also want to try to, to build build back better. We want to get that we want to get that new normal to be something that is that's, that's preferable. And that's a real test of our strategic sort of our strategic decision making and, and how well we know the community and, and, and what we need to to make it successful. And and hopefully of course uh, as we're planning for resiliency we can plan to, to make all three of these kinds of improvements. Um, if we do a really good job, we might be able to actually get back to better than we were before. Now, I mentioned before that, you know, this is the sharp drop is what we sort of expect uh, for an earthquake or a flood or drought or hurricane or landslide or some other uh, fast event. And we're looking at, you know, a, a one day event with, with many years of, of recovery. Now that doesn't quite match up with the time scale that we expect to see from, from climate change overall, although these individual events um, do match that. So the, the, the time scale, and this is a little silly, but the time scale for climate change is, is more on geologic time. You know, we have, we have ice ages, we have industrial revolution, um, we have undetermined future conditions, hopefully not quite so bleak. And uh, we're, we're also, we've never gone through climate change before, so we don't really know how it turns out in the future, hopefully it, it, uh, it turns out well for us all. But the, uh, depending on which news articles you've been reading recently, um, what we really need to do is, is sort of zoom in on this, this descending limb and try and see what that looks like, you know, in, in the, the foreseeable future in terms of climate modeling. And this is, this is just a cartoon line uh, but I, I think what, what we're going to look at is, is a, a series of series of disruptions of different kinds. So maybe a drought one year, maybe flooding another year, and we're going to have to be coming back from those. And we we hope that we don't see, you know, ongoing erosion of our of our ability to serve the community. We hope that with some resiliency planning, what we can do is minimize this up, minimize this minimize the, the, the time and the intensity of the, of the disruptions and uh, sort of maintain the level of service after the disruptions. So that gets into, so those different time scales, sorry, the different uh, scales in the level of, the level of detail are going to be addressed by uh, sort of in, in different ways. So we have we have community resiliency. We can talk about institutional resiliency. We have our, our systems of, of infrastructure that are that are resilient um, beyond the res resilience of the individual elements in those systems. And generally, the the longer time scale 
problems are going to be the ones that have to be addressed uh, by the, the community as a whole and, and by our institutions. But the infrastructure systems that we build with their long lifespans, they need to be able to ride out uh, weather events and, and other events as they occur. So we, uh, you know, our institutions get to design these. We get to choose you know, what, what they look like. Um, and we need to, to pick what's best for them in terms of what events they're supposed to be able to deal with day to day and then also what, what new extreme events they're going to have to deal with. So I'm going to talk about at each of these levels, what are some, some, some things that can be done to improve resiliency. Um, at the community level, we really have to address big strategic questions like why, why is there a city here? This is a, a ship getting loaded with grain in, in Portland. We also see cars getting imported in the background. That's sort of suggesting the economic activity that, that, that supports the city. Uh, we also have some, you know, that's Kelly Point State Park. It's a residential area. Why do people, part of the reason that people like to live here and, and we have, we have our natural areas. We also have represents natural resources and, and water resources. And uh, we have our hydroelectric and our other energy resources. We have our cultural resources and uh, good food to eat, fun stuff to do, urban green spaces that, that we like to hang out at. Uh, we also have some some problems. We have in Portland, we have you know high high housing prices, so we have some vulnerabilities that are that are baked in with that. We have to be able to address those at the same time. So institutionally, our our institutions have to keep up with our community. We have to, as our communities continue, we have to continue serving their their needs and their changing needs. And I want to highlight our this is our, our Tabor to the River program, which was a uh, a program of projects that we did, including green and gray infrastructure, and including a lot of community outreach. So we were able to to meet a lot of our a lot of our ratepayers and um, make sure that the, that uh, our project was was ser serving their needs, and also make sure that we get the credit for it when it happens. Uh, we've we're also trying to ad adapt this the methods that were used to make this a successful program. We're trying to uh, put those in a bottle and, and see if we can use them in our other projects going forward. So that's going to be a, a way that we can perpetuate a, a good, a good, a good process. Um, we also have strate strategic planning uh, to make sure that our interests are aligned or our, our, uh, our activities are aligned with the goals of, of the city as a whole. We're revising that strate strategic plan right now. Um, budgeting is above my pay grade, but but uh, our institution needs to have you know, uh, good financial fundamentals. We need to be able to uh, pay for our projects and, and get bonds over time. And uh, we also have um, been working on a, we have a continuity of operations plan. So in the event of an emergency or disaster, make sure that we can get people to work, make sure that we have plans so that we can respond quickly and get that, that process going. So, as an institution, we operate infrastructure systems. We have our collection systems, treatment systems. We also uh, keep an eye on our, on, our, on our natural systems. And we, we operate those at a, at a certain level of service that, that benefits the, the community. Um, we, uh, we, work, protect our, we protect our water quality. Uh, we do that by you know, keeping, keeping poop out of the river, basically. And uh, we also look for other disruptions that, that might occur around the city if we have if we have nuisance flooding or, or backups or spills. So we 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 sort of see how these systems work together, um, how they, they they depend on each other, the collection system and the treatment system, and also how we have interdependencies with other infrastructure systems around the city. So we don't we don't want to block roads. Um, we rely on on our Bureau of Transportation for equipment and maintenance. Uh, and then that gets down to our, you know, the, the specific pieces of infrastructure. And this is this is a manhole that's having a bad day. It's probably not the manhole's fault. It's probably due to, uh, well, for, for one thing, it's due to very heavy rainfall, the kind that we might expect uh, to see more of due to climate change. But there's probably some other problem uh, in the system that's that's causing that that backup. So we have to think about what what are the different hazards that that are going to affect pieces of infrastructure. Uh, we, we think we should be focusing on intense rainfalls, 
on flooding from the river, on landslides, and also on uh, uh, erosion or other problems caused by uh, degraded vegetation. And we can see how those those could those could wash away our our, our assets, or um, they could over overwhelm their capacity, or uh, silt them up. So we we're sort of looking across at what those failure modes are going to be. And I want to see if if we if we see that and see a, a pipe like that that's that's having trouble, we could ask the question of of how how big is that pipe going to have to be in 2100? And the, the the best crystal ball that we have for for, for gazing at that is the, the global climate models, and and those have been discussed previously. So you know that there's a there's a range of results that's going to come out of them. They also uh, have results at a at a global scale, which we need to uh, connect to our to our local uh, local scale because those those big pixels don't don't help us much. So we need to downscale. Um, what we're what we're hoping to do is is be able to to generate to get downscaled record and and generate uh, design storms and a range of design storms that let us test out different situations. And I've got a, an asterisk on design storms because as I mentioned, the the idea of a design storm is getting a little bit fuzzy when we don't have uh, climate stationarity. It doesn't um, we don't have as much confidence. So we're having a range of design storms or some maybe some long term simulation instead. Is a better way to go. In any case, we'll be putting our predicted future rainfall through uh, through H and H models, and that lets us see where our pipes are at capacity, where we might have risk of flooding or backups. And um, we we have our asset systems management, which lets us see which properties are going to be affected by those, which streets, which manholes. We can put dollar values on that and um, estimate a, a current value. For, for that uh, for that impact, that gives us a budget for uh, what kind of improvements we could make right now, and it, and then we have to go back through the level of detail and, and decide if construction is the right answer to that, or if um, we need to look somewhere else in the system. If we need to look upstream for inflow reduction or downstream for for a capacity, if we need to look um, if maybe that that money would be better spent on on response and repair. Uh, or or just liability and uh, and that um, gives us a few options uh, in the next phase of our project as we start to to plan our our initial our initial actions so that's a very fast run through on on our resiliency master plan and some of the the concepts behind it uh, I think it's time to pass back to Matt yes thank you Nick So for the final piece here, we're going to just briefly just talk about um, uh, why we should do something about this. Why is this important? Why do why does it matter? Um, and um, let me steal this from Nick here. Um, and I'll just briefly um, mention um, that there are a lot of great efforts that are already underway, um, and that's that's pretty significant. Um, you know, there are a lot of different um, communities that are, are taking these matters seriously and are. Um, um, conducting these types of studies so, and taking a look and seeing what what is reasonable and uh, and what we can do about it um, and there are also a number of, of, of tools that we can use um, there there are all sorts of uh, modeling groups uh, that that are able to help us understand what the possibilities are for the future and understanding our own system uh, the our system that is and how it will affect us and affect our change um, and you know, how, how do we accomplish this? I mean, it's one thing if you uh, live in a place where, or work in a place where you have, um, this is, is at the forefront of everyone's mind and they want to do everything that they can to, um, to, to affect change, um, to help make our utilities more resilient toward uh, a changing climate, but uh, not, not everywhere has that luxury. Um, but one of the things about climate change is that it's very easy to um, politicize, but um, a little bit harder to fly under the radar. Uh, and there are actually some really great methods that can be uh, used uh, to, to do just that, fly under the radar. Um, we just use this, the means within the system that we already have in order to affect change. 
um, whether that be when we're going to be conducting some sort of capital project like a building upgrade um, or new infrastructure, whether it's stormwater or uh, wastewater treatment or drinking water treatment, whatever, uh, or if you're digging up the street because you have to replace an old pipe. Um, those are those are the instances where you're already conducting regular operations, things that you're already doing as part of managing your utility, where you can say, hey, you know what, maybe we can do this a little bit differently. Maybe we can apply new design storm criteria. Maybe we can go and make this a more green building. Those are the opportunities where you don't even ever have to mention the words climate change, where you can actually make your utility more resilient toward a changing climate. Um, and then when it comes to communications, um, it can be frustrating to have those types of discussions with folks um, and largely because uh, you're starting to uh, but um, when, when people start to talk about their belief systems um, and the way to actually have a conversation about it, um, it does not involve, uh, you know, beating people over the head with scientific facts because that often makes people sort of retreat back into their uh, um, comfort zone uh, and maybe shut down the communications. It doesn't really actually get anywhere. Um, when, when you can relate to other people and say, hey, you know what, you like fishing, I like fishing. Um, you know, have you noticed there have been fewer, uh, fewer steelhead uh, lately? Um, when you connect with people over common uh, shared values, then you can actually have a conversation about the significance of it. And just as the last piece I want to mention, it was one of my favorite little cartoons um, that I like to show a lot, is that, you know, what if, right? What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> what if? What if indeed? Um, so with that, I will um, say that I think we are concluded. So Cindy, if you want to maybe say a couple final words or if we're just complete there. Thank thanks. you for coming, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks so much for attending.